Okay, I think we're going live so you can check on your Facebook page. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the sanctuary. This is Wendy Cherry. And we are about to go live here talking about ways to help heal trauma. So give us a second because we are trying to make sure that we um, are able to share because this is a this is going to be a great session and we want everybody to be able to ask questions and talk to the expert here about what she has going on. So here we are, perfect. And as you're coming in, please shout us out and let us know where you are um, tuning in from. Okay, so again, I'm Wendy Cherry, and I am the host of the Sanctuary Radio Show. Thank you for joining us today. Today is a really cool show. I'm super excited because I have my very own niece. This is Amira, Amira Fuller, who is my sister Amy's daughter. Um, and she's my eldest niece out of like 13, 14 uh, nieces and, and nephews. She um, lives in Texas and she is a licensed master of social work and she's working on cosmetology, but I'll let her tell you about herself. Welcome to the Sanctuary Radio Show, Mira. Thank you. Hi everybody. Um, so I'm Amira. I am a licensed social worker. So I went to the University of Texas and graduated in 2014. Um, I have my bachelor's in human development and family sciences. And then I went on to get my master's in social work from Texas State in 2018. Um, and I'll be getting my cosmetology license by the end of the summer. So I'm finishing up my hours this month and I'm super excited about that. Okay, so now talk to us about like cosmetology. If you went all the way to, through college and got a master's in social work, that you're in cosmetology school, how does that work? What, how did you match that together? Yeah, I think it was just really pursuing the things that I love. So I really have always loved doing hair, um, but I've also loved doing social work too, just, just being a helper. Yep. Um, I think that my purpose on earth is to teach people how to love. And so I think that being able to help them through social work, whatever that looks like, because that's uh -huh. really field or helping them feel good because we all know when we get our hair done we feel like a new person yeah so, kind of like our crown and so um just finding a way to connect everything that I love because I really want to learn and grow and do so many different things to help people so it just nat naturally kind of went together that's awesome and you know it's true when people get their hair done they definitely if they like it because I got my hair done one time before. I looked in the mirror and I passed out on the floor. They had to call the ambulance to come get me straight up, eighth grade. <laughs> so, but if you love it and if you like what's going on, um, uh, it makes you feel differently. So I have like two of my line sisters. I have all Soros on here right now. I have Christy. We have our cousin, Virginia. I have Sharon and my back door, Sharif is on from Texas. She works with your mom and my line sister, Yancey. So for those who know, I cut my locks. Like this is my new look, right? I had locks for eight years and I loved them and they were beautiful. And when I first had them, um, my hair is curly. So when I first started them people actually came out of their mouths and said what'd you do with all that pretty hair they actually said that to me and then i had my locks and i feel like i learned a lot and blah 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 and now i was ready to release i'm about to be 50 in four months three months and it was time for a release and amira i feel really good, good. so hair does make people it can make you feel good so you were able to understand that and want to bridge that um, through your work. So what does that look like? What does that look like for you? I mean, it really can look like many different things and I don't necessarily want to limit myself. I feel like I really just try to pursue just ways of helping people and just let kind of life just lead me down what that path looks like. Um, Talking about... 
I started um, thinking me. about the business um, a couple years ago. So it's something that just kind of came naturally and it just kind of came to fruition right when it was supposed to. So I think just being really open and I think, you know, they say when you go to a salon, your stylist is like your therapist anyway. Yeah. So I, kinda, <laughs> I just really just go in and be myself and just try to educate people around mental health or their hair. Yeah. Or if I can drop some gems. However, we get to kind of come in contact with each other. And even in my job, I find myself like noticing people's hair or giving them little hair tips here and there. So it's just really just, I feel like being myself and doing what I love. So I'm listening. So for those of you who are here, most of you, I see my sister, I see my, my sorors, Alpha Ada's in the house, Delta's in the house, Yo Mama's in the house, Amy Dawn's in the house, right? Mm -hmm. But listen though, do you all who are listening, Erica, our cousin Erica, um, Pin Pin, it, it's one of those things where you're like, what, 26? Mm -hmm. And to understand this, definitely makes me believe that you're doing exactly what you're born to do because many people don't know what they want to do even at 26 but you seem to be very comfortable and and um clear about what your path is so kudos to you kudos to you for being able to do that i'm super proud i have to take a little moment so regina this is my niece right here and I held her first. She came out and they gave her to me. So I love hearing all of this and I love watching her grow and definitely wanted to support her in her um, and uh, on her endeavors. I see you LaSalle, Virginia State in the house. And um, she has some really good information for us. So we are in a time of we are in a time of a pandemic we are in a time of increased stress i think that we had a kind of like a, um a point where it was like really really stressful and then everybody kind of like calmed down because it became uh, almost normal for us to live in this way but now it's about to probably start ramping up again so that's why I have you here on the Sanctuary Radio Show during this, what I'm calling summer school, is because I want us to be able to prepare for what's coming in what they're calling the second wave of Corona. So you live where, Amira? I'm in Austin, Texas. Right. So Texas. Texas done shut down, then they done opened. And what is happening now? What's happening now, one, and then the second question is, how do you feel about it? So right now, I, it's really kind of hard to keep up with this. We just talked about that is really stressful too. Um, I think they recent, they opened things kind of all at one time, it felt like, but they said they had like decreased the capacity for like how many people could go to bars or restaurants or whatever. Right. Um, and then we had a spike in cases again, which of course, and so now they've kind of gone to closing down the bars again, but restaurants are still open. So sometimes it feels like week to week, you just really have to check in to see where you can and can't go. And so I just really been hanging out at my house because right. I know I can be here. So for you and for your friends. So I know that people were angry at younger people. If you're 26, people were angry at younger people who just wanted to get out, who just wanted to be out. Um, we, as this generation of people who are alive right now, unless you are what they call an, um, a silent generation person, which is a person who comes from the World War, their parents were World War II, like grandma is from the silent generation. We haven't seen anything like this before. So we don't know what it looks like. We've never felt this before. So we don't really know how to act. Mm -hmm. But what were your friends feeling? What were you and your friends feeling about and, and how stressful was it for you to not have to go out? Because my daughter, you know, Sydney, your cousin, who's 17, she was wilding out. In the beginning, she actually had a meltdown in the kitchen where I almost had to be like, pull it together, Sydney. <laughs> You cannot go out, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. how are you feeling? Because what I wanna get us to is how stressful this time can be. 
I mean, honestly, I enjoy being in the house and just hanging out inside. And I found a lot of my friends felt the same too. So I can say like my younger sister is 19 now. So she, I think, had a couple meltdowns in there. Yeah. But really, I think for majority of myself and my friends, we were really cool just hanging out inside and just finding things that we can do. Um, right. One of my friends, we like went to the same restaurant, but like parked our cars next to each other. And we literally just like ate in our car and talked. Okay. Um, game nights, but like on apps, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think just really trying to be as positive as possible. That's what I would say about my group of friends, just really trying to find what is it that we can do, kind of what can we do mindset and not right. what can't we do what can't kind we of do? Right. So I think that we all just need to try to be as positive and hopeful as we can and then just try to be safe because Corona is no joke. Right, especially for the African-American community. Mm -hmm. We are having worse, worse health outcomes than many other communities, except for now. Um, hey, Greg, hey, LaTonda. Um, and now they're saying though that the Latinx community is mm -hmm struggling too. So I don't know if they have surpassed the African-American community of people who are being affected, but I know that in the very, very beginning, um, when we were like really on lock and we would like sneak to the store and just come right back, I would see people from that community just gathered sitting outside. And I was like, oh, I wondered, what I really wondered was how was the information being passed down to them? Mm -hmm. How were they supposed to know? Who was telling them in their community? Mm -hmm. I, I, was, I was betting on that some of them were English as second language. So maybe they weren't just getting the information. So I'm glad to hear that you're chilling. Uh, what has happened here, I live in Virginia and I'm Northern Virginia. And what has happened here is just in the last few weeks, 100 students from the high school in a county that's not too far went to Myrtle Beach and 100 of them now have tested positive for coronavirus. Mm. So, it, it, and that's Virginia. However, Virginia is opening up stage three today. So I feel like it gives people the sense that it's okay, um, but I feel like you still, like you're saying, you really have to still be very careful because, um, you know, I really feel like, and, and Amira knows her auntie, I'm a conspiracy theorist. They just trying to get the money. They don't care what's happening to y'all. So just be careful of going out. And I'm, you know, I'm going to be careful too. So let's talk about ways that stress. So everybody can be stressed out. If you are stressed out, anybody who's watching or have been stressed out, please give us the, uh, the little thumbs up or whatever you want to let us know that you're watching, but then also so we'll know how to inform. Um, and what I would like Amy to do, Amy, I'm looking at Amy, Amy's her mama. I was looking at Amy's uh, thing on here. What I would like Amira to do is to share ways that we can decrease our stress because it's a stressful time. Um, I believe that there's more stress going to be coming and you have information on, and also people are being traumatized. Children are being traumatized. Adults are being traumatized. So you have a presentation that can kind of help us break down some way. You're going to explain to us what trauma is. We'll both talk about what trauma does to the body and then what you can do to help mitigate some of the stress so that you can use these tools now but then you can also use them if things tighten up a little bit again and you will have a better transition than we did the first time. So you can share your screen and I will. Um... And I think one thing too around stress, really the goal isn't to lessen stress is to increase your stress management skills, right? Because stress is just something natural that happens in our life and it's okay. not about what happens to you is about how you respond to it, right? So we can definitely look at some of those things, but I can't promise I can take your stress away, but I can try to help give you some tools to manage it better. Okay, thanks for that. Thanks for that correction. That's a good note, a good point. Are you guys able to see that screen? Yes. 
So I thought a good place to start was just getting some background information. So a good place to start is like, what is trauma in the first place? So you can see it's defined as an event or situation that can cause fear, horror, helplessness, threaten your physical or psychological safety, or includes a loss of control. So I think it's good to understand exactly what it is that we are talking about, right? So there's technically two um, kinds of trauma. So one um, is acute trauma and the second is complex trauma. So generally we can um, incorporate trauma into one of these two groups. So an example of acute trauma would be something that is like a single isolated event that occurs in someone's life that maybe causes that fear, horror, or helplessness feeling that we talked about. So an example could be losing a loved one, a natural disaster, um, getting into a car accident. It's something that happens and it's a single incident. Um, some things that you can do to take care of yourself is to get immediate support right after that incident occurs. So the sooner you can reach out and get that support, the better. Um, you can maybe try some different types of therapies. You can try using like some crisis intervention possibly some medications if your doctor, you know, suggests or prescribes for you for some immediate relief just to help you get through that time period while your body, your mind, your spirit are trying to heal. Um, complex trauma is going to be when somebody um, experiences multiple or prolonged traumatic experiences over a period of time. So that's going to be something like maybe um, someone in, in a relationship experiencing domestic violence, maybe over like a five year span, right? It's where they're having repeated traumatic experiences over time. Complex trauma gets really sticky. Um, it can usually start when somebody's in childhood and it usually occurs in the primary caregiving system. So maybe like a parent or caregiver or guardian. Um, and it usually includes some type of maltreatment. And what happens is when people experience that their brain, especially when in children, their brain is not able to develop or grow in a way where they can um, move out of that place, right? So it's really important regardless of whether it's acute or complex to reach out and get support so that you can start that healing process because it is a journey, like everything else in life really. So just to look at some of the effects over the lifespan, I put some notes on there because I want everyone to keep in mind that everyone's different. So not everybody perceives situations the same. So you never wanna downplay somebody's experience or say it's not really a big deal because something that might be traumatic for one person may not be traumatic for another, right? Um, there was a study done in 2010 and it showed that at least half of Americans had experienced a traumatic event, right? So it's really prevalent. So it's not something that I don't think a lot of people talk about, but it's definitely happening all the time to a lot of people. And then recognizing that it affects your mind, body, and your spirit. So when you don't mentally feel good, you could possibly not physically feel good. Your spirit can feel like it's dimmed or not shining as bright. You might not feel like yourself. Um, really wanting, like I said earlier, to really get that support that you need. And support can look like a lot of different things. And then just again, noting that prolonged exposure to a traumatic situation or experience can definitely lead to disorder, disease, and death. So when you don't take care of yourself, it really affects your quality of life and can even shorten your life as well. So can I interject right there, Amira? So what happens is, especially for the African-American community, is that we have had prolonged exposure to stress. And so what we're seeing now is just an iteration of what our grandparents saw, what our parents saw, what our great great grandparents saw is persistent um, stress or what they call it is persistent slavery traumatic disorder. It, like when people say PTSD, it, they say post, but we are not in a post situation. We are experiencing this stuff 
every single day. So when people ask, why do, why do people in our community have so much heart disease and diabetes and all these um, health issues, a lot of times it's because um, we have not managed or learned or given the, been learned or given the tools to manage stress. So Amira made an awesome point um, earlier where she says it's not to get rid of it, it is to learn how to manage it. And for us, we are taught that, um, you know, black don't crack and that we are super women, especially women, that we're super women if we're moms, if we work full time, if we have partners and we are trying to juggle all this and um, it's not true. So that is also trauma. It can be traumatic specifically over a prolonged period of time. So she is correct with this disorder, this disease and with the death, which is why we are having high outcomes of um, COVID deaths, one, and two, why so many in our community are, um, you know, sick with uh, lifestyle diseases, um, the diabetes and things like that. But then the other thing is the good news is we have these people out here fighting. That's why people are still fighting. That's why it's important for the revolution to continue in whatever way you play a part in it is because nobody got, we are not going to uh, take this anymore and it affects our, our life. And so you see the beautiful, colorful, vibrant part of the brain. And then you see the pretty much dead part of the brain because we're born we deserve the colorful, beautiful, brilliant, fun, pleasure, joy, laughing and all those things. And that helps us to manage stress one, right Amir? You manage stress when you laughing and when you're with your friends and family and, and doing things like that. So I just wanted to make that point so that we can tie it in together. Thank you. Absolutely. And I think you touch on a good point. It's like I said earlier too, it's not about what happens to you because things happen to us. It's about taking that power back into your own hands to say, okay, what am I gonna do now, right? So it's kind of moving from that, even possibly the victim mindset to the survivor mindset, right? So a lot of times it's how we look at it, it's how we think about it and it's what we do. And it's so powerful for you to be able to say like, I'm not going to let this, affect me from being happy or to take my joy from me anymore. I'm going to do something to change it, right? It takes so much power and strength to do that. And um, another thing I want to point out with trauma over the lifespan is that you touched on PTSD. So when trauma happens, it often can get our brain stuck in a way. So some examples could be like flashbacks or PTSD or dissociations. It's like where we get triggered and we remember that traumatic event or we're re-traumatized again, right? And it reminds us and we just get stuck in this place. And so trauma often can affect your fight or flight mechanism. And that is where you, um, a natural you know, fight or flight mechanism we have is to keep us safe. So it's like when this dangerous things occur, do I run or do I fight, right? So when people experience trauma over a prolonged period of time, that mechanism no longer efficiently works. So they start fighting when they shouldn't fight, fighting when they probably should fight, and it's just all backwards and twisted. And so they often can't recognize danger cues anymore. So sometimes you can find where people get numb to certain things, and it's because it's just happened so often, they don't even know how to respond anymore. Their brain doesn't know exactly what to do. Can I also um, expand on that a little bit? things that we become numb to and things that we just do because that's what has always happened. Um, we have moved ourselves into this tech, this, uh, this technology season, right? So back in the day when, you know, Amira was talking about fight or flight, that is our natural body's instinct. We can't go to the bathroom. You start to haul ass and you try to protect yourself. That's what the fight or flight in a very um, layman's term, right? But that's not just from being chased or being harmed. That's also when the phone is dinging and the kids are calling, but you know you got to get across town to the soccer team for, to drop the kids off for the soccer match. And you and your husband had the argument and you still haven't talked about it yet. 
and you have not had a chance to do any of the to do things on your list. Those things also cause stress, which then causes you to have your fight or flight or adrenaline start to run and the cortisol starts to come out, which is a hormone that, um, you know, you can tell them the technical stuff, but I don't want you to think that just because you haven't had what people consider maybe a traumatic thing, we have normalized getting dings and pings and notifications and, and sitting all day and being under pressure all day. And that's not normal. So that also contributes to prolonged exposure, which then also contributes to more disease, you know, disorders, and then eventually death, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Which kind of touches on the next piece. So I wanted to talk a little bit about historical trauma and epigenetic. So you can see historical trauma is defined as intergenerational trauma caused by events that target a group of people. Um, and then epigenetics is a creates, it's a science that uh, creates an intersection between lifestyle and health. And so I am definitely a super huge science nerd, which I love, but um, really a lot of things come together to support these theories. Um, Plato had a theory that said that we're all born with an innate understanding of the world. And then something that I always remember is that energy can never be created or destroyed. So it can only change form, right? So if you think about it, for me, I know like when I see African-Americans, black people, assaulted and killed, it feels so personal to me. And it always kind of really intrigued me about why I felt so strongly about it. It felt like it was happening to me. It felt like it was happening to somebody I was close to or loved. And then just doing some research and finding more about the background of it was really helpful for me to really understand what it was that I was feeling and what was happening, right? So if you think about it, African-Americans have experienced complex trauma generation after generation for so long. And so what happens is that is passed down in our genes, it's passed down in our energy, and it continues to cycle through our families, through ourselves, right? So keeping in mind and taking, finding ways to really take care of yourself and even trying to limit um, opportunities where you can be re-traumatized. Um, and re-victimize is, is another thing to pay attention to. So it's really, whenever you're experiencing something traumatic, it's good to try to remove yourself from the situation. I mean, right. as far as systematic racism and things go, you can only separate yourself so much, but yep. it's really important to try to surround yourself, your immediate self, you know, maybe step away from social media or don't watch all the videos or don't read everything because right. it's traumatic. And it's right. literally re-traumatizing us over and over and over again. That's what and I want to say. Thank you for that. Because it's true. People think that they're helping or making people aware of people being beaten in the street and they want to post every single video. But we know it because our parents knew it, because our grandparents knew it and our great great parents knew it. We know what it is. But we don't have to keep looking at it because then that's therein is the uh, re-traumatization. So thank you for making that point. Absolutely. So this pyramid here just tries to put in perspective how factors can compile on top of each other and affect somebody's quality and span of life. So you see at the bottom starting, we're already born with that historical trauma, because like I said, that energy just passes down, right? So um, adverse childhood experiences, there's a study um, and a lot of research around ACE is the acronym. Um, and so those could be traumatic experiences or adverse experiences. Um, and then it just kind of goes up from there. And so, like I said earlier, when people experience trauma, especially at a young age, it alters the brain's ability to heal itself, right? So when something happens to us, we're able, the idea is that our body will heal itself. But when people continue to experience trauma, that brain never gets a chance to heal. It doesn't get a pause. It doesn't get to rest, right? So they people can end up going into the cycle, like we talked about earlier, where they continue to put themselves possibly in situations that aren't healthy or relationships that aren't healthy 
um, continue to get into relationships where there may be violence if they experienced that when they were younger, right? So things just continue to cycle. So um, I like this pyramid because it just kind of puts the whole life into perspective, like it says. So now that we have some background, we can talk about what we can do. Because a lot of it is understanding what ha what's happening, which is really important. But the next step is like, so how do we heal and how do we move forward? So I put together maybe three tips that you can use with your children during this time to help. So not decrease stress, but manage it. Um, so the first one is to talk. So um, I really like a quote that I remember back from college and it said that families were the building blocks of society. And so it talked about how at home is where we learn our morals. We learn our guiding codes for life. It's the place that really instills in how we will behave in the community and as citizens later in life in the world. And so it's best if you, your children hear from you what's happening and what's really real, especially with social media and everything happening. You don't want them to be depending on the news and other possible you know, false sources for information. So just talk find out what's going on, um, talk to them about what's going on, make sure that they have an understanding, that they know that they can come talk to you if they need to. The second one is to create a routine. So kids really thrive off of routines, even adults. Um, so finding things that you can do each day or you know, even if you plan a week, what are some things that we're gonna do at certain times, right? or in the morning we eat breakfast together. And then also putting in time for like getting active and getting outside. Uh, most of us are spending a lot more time indoors and at home. So taking time out to eat healthier if you can, to make you know some smarter choices about what you're putting into your body, especially being in the house um, and looking at research around that, whether you need more vitamin D or whatever it is, um, but creating a routine so that the kids know what to expect. Because right. we all can, you know, respond better when we know what's coming towards us rather than being surprised. Um, another thing I would encourage is I know it's technically summer, but we've been in summer for some months, it felt like now. But even like a bedtime is important. You want to make sure that they're getting enough sleep. Um, and then it's going to help you out. All of this setting and routine is going to really help you when school goes back, whenever that's going to be, but possibly in the fall because if they've just been doing whatever, whenever, it's gonna be really hard for them to readjust when it is time to get back to that school routine. And then the last thing is to just love on each other. So um, I encourage you guys to find things that you can do for yourself and for your families. Um, find things that you guys maybe have a bucket list that you wanna to create together, like maybe, you guys could sit down and create a list together, or, you know, create it separately and then come together, but make that part of your routine too. Right. So maybe doing things like, like a, something we did was like a painting with a twist and you can do juices or sodas or whatever it is for younger kids, but do activities where you can laugh and have fun together. Cause right now it's really stressful and something yeah. that's going to help you manage is doing things that make you feel good. Right. So eating dinner together, doing a movie night, a game night, painting with a twist. Um, I definitely encourage you guys to look into like love languages. So there's five of those and seeing how you guys can feed each other's love languages, whether it's like words of affirmation or quality time, physical touch, like what things can you guys do for each other to feel happy and whole while you're at home together during this really difficult time. So I want to go back to a few things that you said there. So these are all great tips. So thank you for these. And I, I want to just share how I'm trying to um, use them. So it's funny because you didn't tell me this, but I innately and intuitively did these things on my own as we were going into the, um, the pandemic. I don't think I was... Uh, as impacted or affected as much as many people because I already worked from home. And so I already kind of knew how to move and it was always on my own time and whatever. So these things I started to do early on. So I started asking my daughter, Sydney, um, about how she was feeling. 
And when we, so we go back really quickly and we talk about um, continually looking at the messaging that's on social and how stressful it can be. So she would run out of her room with her phone in her hand with the newest information, right? You know, how people say, they had said this. They said the whole world was whatever. They said, so I started to ask her, who is the source? Who is the source of this information? So this is how our conversations would start to build. Like I wanted her to also not get dialed into the hysteria of what her friends on TikTok were saying because they had a lot of opinions on TikTok and they had a lot of good information on TikTok, but then they also had people just making up stuff on TikTok. Mm -hmm. And I want her to be able to decipher that, but us talking allowed me to understand her mindset and what she was being um, impacted by in addition to what I was trying to share. The second one was to create a routine. She had school, you know, I always been on my own routine. I do my own thing all the time. So I even had to like get myself a routine so that I wouldn't just be sitting at the computer all day. Um, it was really important. And then the other thing is for parents with teenagers and even your college kids who are home, be really careful with their social media and their, um, their exposure to constant, constant from the time they wake up to the time they go to bed. And even probably some people sleep with the phone in the bed um, of just being on it all the time. I woke up the other night and went in Sydney's room at five o'clock just to check on her. That fool was in there on the phone. And I was like, Sydney, you're supposed to be asleep because you also don't feel well when you don't rest. You know what I'm saying? And all the exposure to the blue light and all those other things also affect the brain in a way that doesn't make you feel good. It affects your hormones and those are other really detailed things that you can look up anybody who wants to but if you make sure that your kids are getting off the phone off of their electronics at a decent time so i have instituted the 1 a.m because also it's addictive and so it you know just because they're not eating food or they're not on drugs does not mean that the addiction of the pings and the likes and all the stuff from, from just being online doesn't you know affect you too. So if you understand that, everybody give a thumbs up, please, so we know that you're there and that it makes sense. My line sister Yancy said, this is good information, so thank you. Um, Aaron just joined. So, you know, she's breaking it down, y'all. So, okay. Unless anybody has any questions, please ask questions because she, you know, she's here to answer them. Okay, go ahead, Amira. And I think something too, we had talked about a photo I had posted the other day, which could go yes. well with these. So yes, I heard a long, like maybe, I think it was like my freshman year in college, but somebody said like, don't ask people how they're doing because people are kind of even numb to that question and people just say fine or good. Okay. Yeah, because that's just how people come out. So they have suggested like ask them how their spirit is today, because that's uh, going to like throw them off balance. And they thought they had an answer. But now you ask something different. They got to really take it in and think about it. So some other questions you can ask instead of how are you or how have you been sleeping? What color is your heart today and why? Um, what lies do you find yourself believing? These are some deep questions, but good conversation to talk. Yeah. Um, what story are you telling yourself today? What thoughts have been circling in your mind? How can I support you? What are you? What are your top three feelings today? And what have you done just for you today? Wow. So one of those really thought provoking questions, because it's like I most of us, when we ask people how they are, we actually really want to know. So yeah. ask different types of questions to really invoke people's thought and to get their brain thinking in a different way because when you're like how what are three feelings you have today they really have to think about it right correct that can help with the either the talking or the loving each other and you know and in, in my work with families we used to make that part of the family's routine where like they would do it in the morning or they would do it right after school and they okay. would do like a little family check-in and really sit down and ask people how is their spirit or how are they really feeling today okay um 
All right, we can go to the, is there any other slide? Yep, one more. Okay, yeah, so I, I wanna set it up, ow. So Amira is going to be marrying her, uh, wedding her, her love for social work with cosmetology. Now, the interesting thing is my mom, her grandma was a, a, a social worker for many, many decades. And her mom was also, Aime, her mom was also a cosmetologist. So you got grandma and mom and then your grandmother on your dad's side. You're yep. taking all of that together and you are your own little upgrade on all those things. So tell us about your, um, your own brand of healing and, and what you're um, interested in doing. Yeah, so I recently started a nonprofit called Therapy. And so it is a, a therapeutic mobile salon. And so our mission is to provide therapeutic care care services to those who are experienced physical, emotional, mental health hardships. So those hair care services include makeovers, which will be haircuts, um, hairstyling, manicures, and makeup, um, as well as hair care classes, because it's kind of like you can give the horse the water or lead the horse to the water, you know, and I want people to be able to fix their own crowns and feel good about what it is that they can do for themselves, right. even after, you know, their makeover with, with us. Um, I really hope that this is going to bring healing for a lot of people. I think that being able to go out to places and make sure that people can have that special experience of getting their hair done and feeling like a new person, feeling empowered, feeling hopeful, feeling more confident is really going to change how they see themselves and how they see what it is that they can do for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so we hope to serve people in um, group homes, treatment centers, nursing homes, um, those in the foster care systems. I think it'll be something so special to be able to teach foster parents. I used to work in a residential treatment center. So I was um, helping basically raise um, teenage girls and helping them through their treatment program. And so being able to even help people that are taking care of those girls or boys or however they identify, um, teaching them how they can do, you know, the kids that they're working with here, it could be something that's so special and that could really build that therapeutic alliance. So um, some of the things to note that um, I'm gonna make sure all of our staff are trained in trauma-informed care okay. um, and making sure that they are able to take care of this population and all of their needs. Um, and then some of the long-term things I want to do for therapy is I want to do an annual hair show. Um, so stay tuned for details about that. Okay. Um, and, and then so right now I'm really working on um, getting people to invest. So there's my website there. You can check out, you can donate there because mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm working. Oh, yeah. I'm working on right now to get the actual mobile truck. Um, so looking for grant opportunities for people to invest so that we can bring this healing service to people and not ask them to give anything because they've already given a lot. Right. Right. That sounds awesome. I, you know, if, if anybody out there knows of anybody who has like a good truck or has any resources to share with Amira, she is, um, go to ilovetherapy.org and I put it in the description box. Also, um, she's on Instagram at I Love Therapy, so you can keep tabs on her. But I feel like everybody loves to get their hair done. And what I was noticing and what, you know, what we know is that even through the pandemic, going to get your hair done was one of the things that people were just willing to do. You know what I'm saying? Like the grooming aspect of it to make themselves feel better. It also um, is a way to give you comfort. Besides mm -hmm. this grooming, it also feels good. Um, you know, like I, I, like everybody knows I just cut my locks off after eight years. And yesterday it felt good to have Adwana from Twisted Sister just massaged my head. I haven't had a head massage like that in a long time and it felt like it calmed me down and I just felt better. I felt more peaceful. So mm -hmm. therapy through hair is very important. So I look forward to um, seeing you grow with that. Uh, okay. Let's see, let me see if we have any questions, but do you have any last thoughts before we end Amira? 
you have your um, your sisters from our goddess group here. We have Sabrina, we have Sharon here to support you. Um, do you have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Okay, so do you have any last thoughts? Oh, Erica's here to our cousin. Any last thoughts before we uh, end today? I just want to thank everybody who tuned in to learn about trauma and more about therapy and healing. Um, thank you to you, Auntie, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share. Um, so I just encourage anybody to reach out, even if you have fun ideas, whatever it is, I'm definitely open in here to hear, open and here to hear about it. So um, you can reach me at um, I love therapy at gmail.com. You can reach me at I love therapy.org. Um, my Instagram, like she mentioned earlier, is I Love Therapy. So I hope that you guys all grow to love therapy too, just as much as I do. Yes, I think it's a beautiful idea. And, um, you know, we just look forward to you growing and, you know, moving this forward. And if anybody felt like they got any good information, please share the video. Please make sure you like the video. I'm going to be posting it on YouTube um, so that more people can see. But if you feel like you got a nugget, if any of the tips helped, please consider making a donation to Herapy. So on my show, I talk about the exchange. It's the exchange of information. This, this too is how you can support a black business. So it's not just the always receiving, receiving, it's also the, the giving and the receiving. And so we hope that somebody will donate and we thank you in advance. We thank you for joining us on the Sanctuary Radio Show. I'm very proud of you, Amira. Thank you for coming on and sharing such great information. Um, the rest of the month uh, through August, we will have other guests. The goal is to help us prepare for the second wave of Corona and beyond with tools to help us not be caught out there like we were last time. You know, in the beginning of this, we were caught out there. People were rushing around, getting toilet paper, stressed out, eating a whole bunch of food, gaining the Corona 15 and all that. You don't have to do that. There are things you can do to help mitigate some of it. Like Amira says, she can't, you can't take away the stress, but you can definitely uh, learn tools on how to manage the stress. So our cousin Virginia said, good, good job. And Auntie Erin said it was awesome. So we thank you all and we will see you next Wednesday in the sanctuary. Peace. Thank you guys. Bye.